Welcome to the continuation of week four. It's nice and brisk out, if you haven't noticed. All right, good. Now we're paying attention. Congratulations. Took you a whole minute. All right, so we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Uh, last week, we left off just at when I was talking about data types. Um, there's about 20 slides left in this slide deck. And then I got to talk about assignment one, which is being released to you guys today. Um, explain what the rules of engagement and stuff like that are. And then uh, I may continue talking about data types if time permits. Um, this is off script as in if there's no slides, it's not going to be on a test. This is just real life knowledge. So we'll see how it goes. All right. So in databases, most database servers have generic data types. So that means that pretty much all database servers carry these specific data types. So you have CAR and NCAR. NCAR is actually specific to Microsoft SQL Server. And as is nvarcar. Um, so the car data type is a fixed length string. So you determine something as car five. So instead of the n, you put in five. It will hold, occupy exactly five characters. Even if you put in a single letter, it will still occupy five characters. Back in the day when computer systems were slow and there was tape to tape, the car data type made a lot of sense because the software knew how far to move the tape to get from one set of characters to the other set of characters. However, space was limited and some clever people came up with something called varcar, also known as a varying character or variable character length fields. So if you go varcar five, that means it will hold up to five characters but it will only occupy the amount of space for the number of characters in it plus a magic set of bytes. So there's like a marker that says the, the field ends here. So let's say you do a varcar 10, you put in ABC, it occupies ABC plus a couple of bytes. If you put in ABCDE, then it'll use ABCDE. But if you try to put in more than 10 characters, depending on the database server, it'll either give you an error, like it should, or what, my, uh, what MySQL will do is to just truncate it. Uh, for you, if you don't know what truncate means, it means it just cuts it off and just puts in, it puts in whatever it can fit. It doesn't even tell you. It just says, dir, good. Well, you try to put something in, and then you'll notice that the whole thing isn't there. That's how you find out it's not there, usually later. Um, you've got uh, date, time. There's also date time, which I don't know why it's not on the slide, but everything has date time. So date stores dates, time stores a time. Uh, date time stores the date and the time. Um, different database servers have different levels of precision on how much precision on date and time it can hold. And you think about precision and you're thinking, well, what do you need to be precise about date and time? For example, Postgres, uh, Postgres, PostgreSQL, the server, will hold uh, time precise to uh, 100 thousandths of a second. So basically a millisecond. It's this precision for time. Um, MySQL apparently now is able to do that also. In version 5, it couldn't. So it's, it's a pretty recent, quote unquote, recent change. Um, integer. I hope you guys know what integers are. If you're level one college in a computer programming course and you don't know what an integer is, you're going to have issues. It's a number that doesn't have decimal places. It's a whole number, end of story. We have decimal and numeric. Now, decimal and numeric are interchangeable. 90% uh, of the database server products out there treat them as aliases of each other. They both do the same thing. And what's cool about decimal, and actually I've got to grab a marker for this, um, is a lot of people don't realize how decimal works. Decimal is amazing for handling money. Now you see that last one, that, that last money type? Money is the, basically a different version of decimal. 
it does some slight different things, but basically put, if I go, um, so the format is numeric or decimal or money, and then the length and the precision. So this means I can store five digits with two reserved for decimal places. It'll do the rounding for you. So if you try to shove something in here that's like 991, it'll do the rounding for you. Don't try to do the rounding. The computer's better at it than you are. Um, so a lot of people don't realize how this works, but it's really cool that this is the five, this is the two, and you can really control how the data gets stored in those types of fields. Now, we have some examples where they put the employee name at Varkar 50. That means we can put up to 50 characters for a person's name. It's cool. Um, some parts of the world, that's not enough. In some parts of the world, it is. Uh, phone number, they use character 15. So it'll hold 15 characters for a phone number. Um, email address, they used nvarkar100. Now, nvarkar is, like I said, it's for Microsoft SQL Server specific, and it stands for Nationalized Varkar. Now, some of you might not know what that means. That means that we can shove in special characters. In other words, it'll hold Chinese characters. It'll hold um, Japanese characters, you know. It'll hold any kind of character. and so Varkar will hold 50 characters with basically one byte for each character. And Varkar will hold 100 characters, but it'll allow up to three bytes per character. Because, for example, uh, traditional Chinese has two to three bytes per character in their, alpha, in their, it's not an alphabet, but in their character set. Japanese is the same. Japanese actually got four character sets, so they have... They use a lot of characters in their code page. Other languages are similar to uh, Arabic's the same. It's got its own set of letters and whatever, you know. And so then we have hire date and review date. Those are just pure date fields. And then employee code for character 18. So the employee code will hold 18 characters. It will always occupy 18 characters, even if you only put in a second a single letter. All right, so there's two tables of common data types. I'm just going to skim over these because there's just so much there that you can look at them yourself. So in MySQL, we have bit. A bit is literally 1 to 64. That's what it'll hold, the number 1 to 64. We have tiny int and tiny int unsigned. So MySQL is special. Um, it's one of the few database servers that has unsigned da uh, data types. So you can give it an integer or tell it also that the integer is unsigned. And that basically gives you one more byte. Now, the other thing that's kind of nifty is that you can actually specify lengths. So for, if you went type int one, it would only ever hold one digits. So if you wrote, Like this, that'll hold the value of zero to nine. Um, other database servers don't let you specify the length of their integers. So it's one of the few things that MySQL does well. Um, so the, the cool part about um, the unsigned integers, and you'll notice there's tiny int, small int, medium int, and big int, and just int. Um, the unsigned one, essentially, when you store in uh, digits in the database server, it always reserves one byte for the sign. Other database servers automatically add one byte. So if you say small int, it'll always have just one extra byte to tell if it's positive or negative. With MySQL, you can tell it this number is never going to be negative, so use that extra byte to store more numbers. So, for example, if you look at the tiny int, it'll go from minus 128 
to 127. But if you do an unsigned, it'll do 0 to 255. Basically put, if you look at 128 to 127, you put them together, it's 255. All right, so it's, you're just sliding the range of values back and forth across the zero. Um, you have float and then real and doubles. Those are basically your typical math, long decimal place kind of thing. Um, they're basically eight byte or four byte floating point numbers. I've seen people use float and doubles for money, for holding money. That's such a waste because they use up more, way more room than a numeric or a decimal. Okay. You've got date, date, time, time, year, and one called timestamp. Now, so date is a date. Basically goes from 1000 BC to 9999 uh, at the end of December 31st. And then you got date time, which basically again goes from 1000 to whatever. You got a timestamp that starts from 1970 to 2038. Pretty soon, the MySQL timestamp data type will be useless. I mean, pretty soon. It's relative speaking. You know, that's still uh, 15 years away. But it is going to have to be fixed. It holds basically. Um, does anybody here recognize 1970-0101? Does that mean anything to anybody in here? Yes. Okay, that's not what I expected, but thank you. You just taught me something I didn't know. Anybody else know what 1970-0101 is? It is known as epoch in computer. It is the start of computer timekeeping. Essentially, if you were running on a Linux server and you asked it for a timestamp, it would give you the number of seconds since January 1st, 1970. A lot of people use that as ways of a quick way to do math because you know what? Date math sucks. It really does. However, take one big number, subtract another big number. You just need to know how many seconds, right? Then you can convert that to hours, days, minutes. Um, time. Well, it's time, right? And it goes from a negative to a positive value of hours, up to 839 hours in either direction. And then you have year, which goes from 1901 to 2155. Honestly, it'll actually take dates before that. Uh, some of these descriptions are actually a little out of date. Uh, they finally fixed some of these. Now we've got the string types, car, var, car, which I described already. So fixed length field, variable length field. Blob. Rule number one, never use blobs. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. Binary large objects. And this is, blobs piss me off because they, they really should not exist. So, there, honestly, the only reason a blob exists in a database and you should use it is if you need to store data in its raw format. For example, you have a registration form on a website that lets people type in in whatever language they want. The problem is that your database table can only handle so many character sets. You can set it to be UTF-8, which will handle almost everything. If you need extended characters, then you need UTF-16, but you can't have a 16 and 8, and you know there's each one does things that the other one shouldn't. And you have the older tab table sets, which is Latin 1, which can even take half of the world's languages. So the binary large object will take the bytes as submitted and store them raw. It doesn't try to convert them to UTF-8. It doesn't try to change it. It literally takes those bytes of text. So the letter A, you know, being 130, whatever, actually 124, ASCII 124, it puts literally the hex value in for A. It goes in raw. Now, the reason why blobs irritate me is because for a while, people thought it was a good idea to store files in the database. You're like, it's a file. It's binary. I don't want to have to manage the file on disk. I'll let the database server take care of it for me. How big are the pictures your phone takes? On average, three, four megabytes, right? Cool. 
Now, Windows search is like the slowest thing on earth. So, okay. And I botched that somehow. 1024 times 1024 times 1024. Okay. That is one megabyte. Times three. Actually, let's go with 3.7 because that's the size my my Samsung takes them at. So that's how much, that's how many bytes a single image occupies. People are like, well, that's not that bad. Now we're going to put in 10,000 images. Do you guys think 10,000 images is a lot? For a company, 10,000 images is nothing. So now let's start undividing this so we're not, in, we're now talking. Okay, so that's sitting at um, 72 gigs. Cool. It's still not occupying an entire one terabyte drive. Now, every single night, you're going to do a backup. Your backup is 72 gigs. You know how long it takes to backup 72 gigs? It's not a trivial, trivial amount of time because the database server becomes unusable while it's doing its magic sauce. But it goes to backup, it locks the table, it dumps the contents of the table, unlocks the table. In the meantime, nobody can use that table. System basically becomes unresponsive while it's doing the backup. A 72 gig backup on our one of our servers has a database of roughly in that size that does not have images in it. And it takes about four minutes. It doesn't sound like a lot. But then let's go 72 gigs. for one year, and you think it's gonna stay at 72 gigs that entire year, you're fooling yourself. So now you're sitting at 26 terabytes a year just in backup for one table because somebody insists on putting in pictures in that table. Now, here's the other thing. Your database server, pardon the phrase, shits the bed. For those of you that doesn't know what that means, that means a database server decide to have an unhappy day and stop working. And you need to recover that. Now, sometimes you get lucky, and it was just a power outage, and the server comes back and nothing is damaged. With MySQL, there's usually one in to 10 chance that it doesn't come back quite right, because it was in the middle of writing the files to the disk, and it blows up while it's doing it, and the files get corrupted. Now you're restoring from backup. The bigger the file, the longer it takes to write. The bigger the data, the longer it takes to write. So if you are going to store files in a database, and a by and when I went with images, I went, those are small. I mean, I've seen Word documents, 25, 30 megabytes, you know, PDFs, 110 megabytes for a PDF, because there's pictures in it. So to do, instead of using a blob, is you use a varchar field, you store a file name, and then you write the file to disk somewhere. Let me can back up the files. And it, every night when it backs up, it only does a differential backup. It only back up, backs up what's changed on the, on the disk, not the entire thing. So the backups are smaller. The database is a, you know, a fraction of the size, so its backups are faster. The odds of damage are smaller because it comes back faster when it's done doing its job. So stay away from blobs. All that long story just to tell you guys stay away from blobs. They're just terrible. Um, it's a common mistake for, for juniors that they discover blobs and they think it's like the best thing since sliced bread. It is, and it has a very specific job, which is storing unconverted bytes. Normally, if it's like text, cool. Like in other words, you're trying to mix match character sets or whatever, or you need to store a um, string that has escape characters in it. Um, you guys probably don't know what that is, but we have a database at work that stores printer driver information, and we actually store escape characters in the database for the commands that, you know, the software will send to the printer. It'll say, send escape, um, escape character 13, which is, which is uh, break to tell, you know, stop, and then here are the commands to do the rest, and it uses, though we store that in the database using a blob. Those things are usually only like four or five bytes. It's just, we have no other way to store it. All right, so moving on from blobs, we've got text. 
We're not going to talk about tiny blob, medium blog blob. Just we're not going to talk about them. Long blob. So we got text, tiny text, medium text, and long text. Now, those are MySQL specific. Every other database server has text or something called memo. So the Microsoft products all have something called memo. Everybody else uses a type called text. Text is designed to hold text, lots and lots of text. It, MySQL, on the other hand, is kind of special. It, if you use just text, it's considered a medium text. And it'll hold 65,000 characters and change. Then it stops. It just truncates. It doesn't even tell you something's wrong. It just, it's done. The long text will hold a very large chunk of text. Um, for example, in Postgres, um, the other top free database, open source database, the text field can, is only limited to the amount of disk, uh, disk space you have. So in theory, you could shove an entire encyclopedia into a single text field, and it'd be just fine with that. And for those of you that don't know what an encyclopedia was, is what we had before Wikipedia existed. But yes, they, I've seen some databases that have, you know, two or 300 megabytes of text in a single text field. Again, see my previous statement about blobs and being stupid. Um, we have enums. Not all database servers support enums. Essentially, what that, the way it works, it's a, it's a special data type where you can determine that only specific values are allowed to go in. So it's enumeration. That's what it stands for. Essentially, you can say, these 10 values are what are allowed to go in here. Anything else will not work. So you're enforcing rules at the beginning. And then you have sets. Um, again, you can put in multiple values as long as it comes in from a specific list of values. And sets exist as an alternative to resolving um, multi-valued attributes. So remember I was talking about multi-valued attributes, like a list of skills a person has. Some people insist on doing it anyways, even though they really shouldn't, and they'll use a set type for that. All right. So those are the common data types, plus MySQL's specific take on them. Now we have null, the null status. So when you define a field, you can specify it as being either null or not null. By the way, the null keyword is optional. If you don't include the word null, it assumes it's gonna be null, unless you tell it to be not null. So it's either not null or it's null. So you can tell it to be not null and anything else can be just left. Now, this one's pretty straightforward. Not null means must have a value, even an empty string or a zero or whatever. It must have a value. Null means it's optional. You can just skip it when you're adding data to the table. It's not going to care. Congrats. It's straightforward. It's just null. And then we have something called default. And we have a bunch of different default values that are set up on this one. And some of them are just showing pseudocode language and some aren't. So item number is a surrogate key. I've already talked to you guys what surrogate keys are. It's an auto numbering, uh, one, two, three, like a clicker. And MySQL implements it by having you use an integer with a special attribute called auto increment. So suddenly it becomes auto incrementing. Category doesn't have a default value. And then what they've done is if they've put in some rules on here as an example, and these are actually a little uncommon, especially in modern database design, because it used to be we'd hard code a lot of these rules right in the database because the programming software was very limited. Back in the day, um, how many of you remember green screens? You know, the old dumb terminals? Even those who passed that are not that old can probably remember walking into Ikea. And before they had the nice little computers to look things up, they had like 
dumb terminals where you could type in something you're looking for and then you just get garbage across the screen that means nothing to you. So back in those days, the interface was not called rich. You had a indication of what you could put on a screen to interact with the person. So we tended to write these rules right in the database. So the item prefix in this case, it's if the category is perishable, then it would actually change the prefix to P, import it to I. Uh, a category is one, then it turns to O, o otherwise it'd be N, in other words, no prefix. Uh, the approving department, it detects that the prefix set to I, then it sets it to shipping and purchasing. Uh, otherwise, it just goes to purchasing. And shipping method, it detects if the prefix is set to P, then it changes how it does it. So you can actually set up the defaults to automatically fill in some of the values. Now, why do, you, do we not do that as much as we used to? A few reasons. One, if we needed to add a new prefix, that requires somebody making changes to the database. We try making changes to the database as much as humanly possible. Why? One mistake, and everything goes wrong. Two, every time we need to add one, we'd still need to change some of the program interface so that when they pick the category, it still needs to pick the media right available one. So often the prefix, in this case, if we added a new category, we might need to adjust the code for the prefix, and that's just gross. And uh, if we're going to be putting stuff in a category with a dropdown, we might as well find some other programmatic way to generate all this stuff instead of relying on rules at the database where it requires all kinds of you know special maintenance to take care of it. All right, then we have data constraints. So data constraints are limitations on data values. So domain constraints limits the column values to a particular set of values. So that sounds kind of weird. Um, it's something that's actually not really enforceable. A domain constraint is means like, for example, if you have a field called first name, the domain constraint for that would be, it'd be limited to people's first names. Could we really force it to just know what people's first names are? No, we'd have to have a list of very all the first names in the world, including the 26 spell, spellings for Kayla. Um, because every time somebody gives birth to Kayla, they decide that they have to spell it a special way. And, or Kaylee is another one I've seen spelt like 12 different ways. I've actually had a case where I had three Kayleys in the class and they were spelt all three differently. Whatever. Range constraints. Range constraints are cool. That means you can set the values to be a minimum and a maximum within a range. So you can say, in this field, you're only going to allow values 1 through 5. Even though it's an integer field, we're only ever going to allow 1 through 5. This leads me back to my previous domain about modern database design. We rarely put the constraints, that kind of constraints, in the database. Because if we suddenly have a change, it's going to require physical changes to the database server. Things are going to start getting weird. Uh, Intra-relational constraints. So that is what this is doing. So it's saying if the category is equal to something, then set prefix this. So prefix depends on category. Approving department depends on the prefix. Shipping method depends on the prefix. So that is an intra-relational constraint. In other words, the values of one column depends on the values of another column in the same table. If those values being put in are not set a certain way, you'll have an error. And then we have interrelational constraints. In other words, the values in one column depend on the values from a different table. This is usually known as a foreign key. So when we create foreign keys, the value foreign into the foreign key field must exist in another table elsewhere. So that's an interrelational constraint. All right, so when we're talking about strong entity relationships, you're going to take the primary key of one entity and put it into another as a foreign key. So this is a one-to-one -one back to the whole locker member thing. So we have a member number here. And basically in the locker table, we got it sitting down here as a foreign key. So 
that's how you generate the foreign key. You, you have the primary key in one table, you create a field in the other table, and you define that it's the foreign key. When you, depending on how you define the foreign key, there's referential integrity rules that come into play, such as null, not null, uh, mandatory identifying or not, um, that kind of stuff. And it'll determine how that foreign key behaves. So the way this is designed right now is the relationship is completely optional in both directions. You can actually have a locker without a member, as you guys have experienced here, lots of empty lockers. The lockers exist. Obviously, they're just not assigned to people. And then there's students in here that don't have a locker. Because you just don't see the point of having a locker. And the same thing with the club member in the locker. That's the same setup you got down there. Um, one to one going across. So this is basically repeating the previous slide. In other words, when you create a foreign key, you take the primary key from one table, put it in the other. So this is for a strong entity. In other words, the foreign key is not part of the primary key. Now, if we're talking about, um, this is a one to N. If I'm going to go back for a second and talk real quick about Actually, you know what? It's going to come in a second, so I'll talk about it in a minute. Um, here is one to many. So you have a club member and a club uniform. Again, you'll have the member number being one to many. So the way it ends up being is down here. So this is the, if it's the conceptual way of doing it, this is the physical way of doing it. So the member number gets carried down as a foreign key. It's one to many. I mean, uh, yeah, it's one to many, optional on both sides. Because a member can exist without uniform, and uniforms can exist without members. At one point or another, people get assigned uniforms. And you literally just carry the primary key. As you can see, there is no difference between the one to many and the one to one. They're done the exact same way. Because honestly, the most database servers don't really have a good way to enforce one to one versus one to many. Because in theory, there's always going to be a case where you end up with one to many when you had one to one to one. It's more of a design concept than an actual physical implementation. So, in a many to many, this is the, actually one of the harder ones for people to grasp. In a many-to-many -many strong relationship, there's no room for the foreign key in both. For example, a company supplies many parts and the parts supply to many companies. So what you end up doing is you create something called an intersection table, also known as a associative entity. And what it does is it stores the corresponding rows from both entities. In other words, the primary key from both. It usually, historically, only ever has two fields. Have the primary key from both tables that does the that does the combination of many to many. And it will like this. So if the first one is many to many, and you'll notice at this point this designed up here as non-identifying. So you can't do a foreign key like this. What you do is you create a third table and you carry down the primary key from each table and for you guys you don't feel neglected you can take the primary key from both these tables and you shove them in the child table as the only columns in there now some of you might be thinking well great that's simple enough concept and for some very specific purposes yes this is more than sufficient however um in modern times database systems require significantly more um, footprints. In other words, we have to have more data to prove when certain things happen. Now, probably most of you in here are too young or probably didn't care, but has anybody here ever heard uh, the phrase source vein Oxley? Enron? How about Enron? Anybody here ever hear about Enron? So that was 
an American company that cooked the books. They falsified all of their accounting data and made themselves look like they had more money than they had. Then suddenly, their invest came due, they had to pay up, and they had no money to pay. And they crippled a significant portion of the American economy, pretty much in 24 hours. Uh, those of us in Ottawa remember something similar happening with Nortel. Nortel was here. Nortel is great. Their accountants were cooking the books. And one day, somebody discovered that Nortel owed five times its market cap because it had actually no money. And so what's happened with that is often now is we have to have additional data on everything. Timestamp. Who did it? When was it done? Anytime there's a change, we put an entry for it. So this kind of entry was more than adequate back in the day. But nowadays, honestly, in here, you'd have a bunch of other entries, like a timestamp and a user ID. And then every single time one gets added, gets removed, gets whatever, we'd be putting out more and more entries in there with those timestamps to make sure that's there. And when you start doing that, this table starts getting complicated because if you just want the primary key to be those two, but you also need to track time, who, when, what, how was it triggered, um, you'll end up having to have a lot more fields in there, and just those two fields are probably not going to be enough. You'll end up having a need uh, to also include like the timestamp, possibly, to your primary key. So then suddenly you got a three-part primary key, and it starts getting complicated. Uh, so what happens often at that point is uh, people will put in some extra logic, have a synthetic key or a surrogate key, and, so, and then so that it's able to stand on its own. And every time a value is put in there, it's marked in as created, updated, deleted. And it only ever shows the most recent one so that we always know. So this is cool. And it's, it is how you resolve a many to many by doing something like this. But this table nowadays is significantly more complex than that. But from a learning concept, it's adequate. So if you know what I mean, the difference of, it's a learning concept. That's how we resolve a many to many by creating an intersection table. However, in practice, in the real world, that intersection table is going to be significantly fatter than just two fields. It's going to have more things. It's going to be as fat as I am. Timestamps. So it'll have a created timestamp, a modified timestamp, uh, a, a couple of fields for tracking the user who did it, uh, potentially uh, a field to track what application triggered the change. So we need to know. For example, somebody creates a fake invoice. We need to know when the invoice is created, who created it, what application created it. Because if it's not populated properly, then we know that somebody was messing with the data. So there's all this kind of information, right, that needs to be tracked. There's extra stuff that needs to be tracked. It's not that complicated. It's just from a learning concept, all you need is the two foreign keys. In practice, in the real world, I like some of the databases I write, we still have some tables that are just two columns for things that are not important. Um, tracking uh, users and their login history, for example. We have two tables to keep track of that, and it's a many-to-many -many relationship. Well, sometimes we'll have another table in between just tying, you know, logged in from this source, this person logged in from this source kind of thing. And that's all we track is that. Um, there's a few things we do that have no be modified. It's, you know, it's not something somebody would want to fake. Or we don't need to worry about undoing it or anything of that nature. Okay, so now we're going to talk about ID dependent. These are weak entities. And we're going to talk about doing the many-to-many -many and the associative relationships, multi-valued attributes, and the instance relationships. So an intersection table holds a relationship between the two strong entities and a many-to-many. -many. It contains only the primary keys of the two entities, as we had just discussed. Um, an association table has all the characteristics of an inter intersection table, but it'll have some extra stuff. So do you know, just a minute ago, I was talking about 
how in modern use, this is not something you see very much because this is an intersection. We have an association table, which is what we have way down at the bottom, right over here, which is totally unreadable. I guess it's kind of readable, maybe for the first three rows. Um, so we have part, company, coming down in here, but we also have a price. So that's an association table where each part number with the matching company can also have a price associated with it. So for example, um, when parts get sold to a company, they get sold for a certain price. And depending on how good that company's negotiator is, one company may not pay the same price for those parts as another company. For a good example is, you know, you go to a mom and pop garage. They're not going to get as cheap a price on the parts as, say, Canadian Tire. Why? Because Canadian Tire has a lot of purchasing power. Therefore, they buy things in bulk. They get to save a bit of money, maybe. Maybe a buck on each <laughs> on each set of brakes, but it's still a dollar that they save towards their bottom line. So this is known as a an association table, which is the exact same thing as an intersection table, but it has extra meat in it. Like a minute ago, as I was talking for modern database design, there'd be a bunch of other fields in here, as in date, timestamps, that kind of stuff to keep track of when things happen. And that slides keep getting denser and denser. So this is another one where we have a three-part key. It's the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, basically put, we have one table doing association of three other tables plus the hours worked. Um, so you have a client, you have an architect, and you have a project. And depending on the architect books hours against a certain client for certain projects, and that's the number of hours they worked. Uh, anybody who's ever worked in a consulting type environment, you know very well about how important logging your hours are. Um, I did work for a few years for a company that did consulting, where every hour we worked was had to be booked, minus you know a few specific hours. Every hour we worked every week had to be booked against a specific project for a specific client. So that at the end of the month, the owner could you know create the invoices, run some billing and give an invoice so that we get paid the next month if we're lucky. And that's what this setup is right now. So you've got the client, you've got the architect, in other words, the employee, you've got the project, you put the three sets of keys together and you have the hours worked. So we tend to design for maximum cardinality. So relationships can have multiple types of uh, minimum cardinal. So we know about one-to-one, -one, many to one and one to many. Uh, many to many, parent mandatory and child mandatory. So many to many parent mandatory and child mandatory is an odd one. Um, so normally what we do is we f use the term minimum cardinality enforcement. In other words, we're saying, this must or must not have a value. That's the minimum. So optional versus mandatory. And you don't need to do anything special for optional optionals. In other words, data can go in table one, data can go in table two, totally independent from each other. Nothing happens. So when you enforce minimum cardinality, when you do an insert, you insert... Um, so if the minimum cardinality is required and you do an insert in the parent, there's nothing special happening on the parent. However, uh, if you try to insert the child, have a parent, otherwise it, it'll fail. That's what that's saying. Uh, these slides are really hard to read. They actually come right from the textbook and the textbook covers this in a bit more detail. Um, so if you do an update, you have to change the child's foreign keys to match the parents' foreign keys. But here's what's really fun about this, is a lot of people will go, oh yeah, we're gonna do this uh, one to many mandatory, you know, mandatory the parent, mandatory the child. And you end up with a chicken before the egg problem. Primary key is one, foreign key is one. They both must be equal to each other. Change primary key to two. 
foreign key still one. It's going to say, no, you're not allowed to do that because it exists here. Therefore, two is not allowed to become one. Okay, let's change it down here. Two, no, you're not allowed to do that because it's not up here yet. So that's why database servers really don't, don't actually enforce the mandatory on both sides because it's almost impossible. So it's always going to be parent child optional, child parent mandatory. In other words, at that point, you could change this key. You could change the key down here first and then change that one. So you could copy the record, give it a new ID, change the value down here, delete the old record. It's really gross. And then on the delete, you delete the parent, it deletes the child records. If you can't delete the child records, it basically prohibits it. In other words, it cannot cascade delete. Uh, cascade deletes are really cool in the database server. Um, it's an amazing piece of technology. Uh, when you define your foreign key relationships using SQL, which you'll learn after the break, um, you can set up the rules that says, this is a foreign key that comes from this table and on delete cascade. So you kill parent record and it wipes out all the children too. Like it's a single command that basically erases an entire family tree. So that's the cascade. So if the child is required, you try to do an insert, you try to get it. And the parent tries to get the child, it fails. There's no action on the child because if the child is requiring a parent, it's not going to allow it to happen. And same thing. If you can't modify the foreign keys, it prohibits it. Uh, and delete, nothing happens because a parent can exist without the child record. So you can always lose children and the parents keep going until there's no more children. Then you can get rid of the parent. So that's if you can't do a cascade. All right. So we have a setup with multiple columns. So if we look at this table set, so we got a company name. The company name. The company has several contacts, so each company can have one or more contacts. And the way this is designed is a company cannot exist with a, a contact, which leads me back to my whole thing of it's actually impossible to enforce required on both sides at the same time. Because if you need to add a contact, but the company must exist, and you need to add a company, but the contact must also exist, which one happens? It can't because they both must exist at the same time. So really the way it would actually be is the company would go in first and then you'd add the phone contact. But as a business rule, when you're designing the application, you wouldn't allow the record to be created without a contact. So you'd one, then the other, and you enforce the rule that way. Um, the company can have multiple departments or none. If the company works you work for is small enough, there might not even be departments. And then each department can have multiple employees and the department is non-identifying. In other words, the employee can exist without the department, which leads me to a big flaw in this database design. Can anybody pick out what the flaw is? So company is mandatory to department, right? The department is optional to employee. What's the flaw? I'm starting to hear some whistling from the steam. We can create employees and not know who they work for. If the employee can exist on its own without a department, Therefore, we can put department employees in here and we'll never know who they work for. It's a flaw with this design. And I don't know if that was the point of this slide when the person who created these slides. I don't know if that was the point why they created this slide, but that's my takeaway from this slide. Technically, totally correct database design, totally useless database design. Hey, it's entirely possible for something to be correct and be useless at the same time. Or actually, let me rephrase that. It's possible for something to be not incorrect. Because it's possible to be not incorrect, but not be correct either. 
it's totally useless. Realistically, what you'd have is you'd also have a relationship between company and employee. That way, at least, you'd always know who's working for a given in company, and then you can determine what department they work for. So you'd just have one more relationship from here to here. Where for you guys on this side, you need one from here to here, going from this guy to this guy, so that we always know who the employee works for and if they have a department. Okay, cascading updates occur when you change a parent's primary key and it's applied to the child's foreign key. Now, if you use surrogate keys, the surrogate keys will never change. Therefore, there is never a need for a cascading update. And cascading updates are a real pain to do. Um, yes, some database servers support it. And you set it up so that it, uh, it does the updates as it should. Um, there's always a risk associated with that. So for example, we're using somebody's SIN number as our primary key. And I've said it before, never use a person's SIN number as a primary key. But let's pretend for a minute we're using somebody's SIN number as the primary key. And their identity gets stolen, so they get a new SIN number. You give the SIN number to the clerk. Clerk does an off by one entry. You know, instead of being one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, they go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Then it cascade updates everything, parents and child. And we never find that person again in the system. Because now don't all know what his SIN number is. Surrogate keys, on the other hand, never change. So you don't need to do the cascading updates. You're never going to lose any of the child records. You're not going to have any of that overhead. A cascading delete occurs when the child rows are deleted along with the deletion of the row. This is actually pretty common. Uh, it is used on non sensitive data. For example, um, a login log is non-sensitive data. You delete a user, if the user's not in the system anymore, you don't need to worry about their login history. Who cares? They're gone. On the other hand, if you, you try to delete a customer and they have orders, you shouldn't ever allow that to happen because order history is a legal thing. You start deleting order history where you've taken people's money and then you make the orders go away to make it look like you didn't get an order. That's illegal. It's called fraud. Big companies never do that. No, there's never been big companies like Enron or Nortel that have done things like that. Ever. No, that's why they're still around. Wait, no, they're not. Because they got caught doing stuff like that. So the database can enforce a cascade delete. So you delete the parent record, it takes out the child records with it. Great, but you don't do that on everything. You don't allow that rule on everything because otherwise you might have a really bad day. Um, so for strong entities, you generally do not do a cascade delete. In other words, um, back to our um, club member and uniforms. We delete the club member. We don't want to lose the uniforms because the uniforms are strong entities. They can exist without the club member. And ditto for the other side, right? The uniforms only ever assigned to one guy, so we delete that one. We don't want the cascade to go the other way either. So for strong entities, in other words, entities can stand on their own. We do not allow cascades. Same thing. You don't allow a customer to be deleted and take out their orders. You don't cascade that. As it is, really, you don't even allow the customer to be deleted. For weak entities, we can do cascade deletes. My earlier example of a user table with a login log. So every time somebody logs in, we log who logged in, when they logged in, what IP address they logged in from. It's good to know if our employee that's sitting in Ottawa is actually logging in from Russia. Because you know they're not in Russia. Somebody over there stole the credentials. So when we start tracking where they're logging in from, we need to know that. And if we delete the user, 
we don't need to worry about that data anymore because it's irrelevant. So that's a week, so we can cascade delete. It's less programming code to maintain, let the database take care of it for you. So when it's optional to optional, we don't need to do anything. When it's mandatory to optional, we do anything that is required to the parent. It's easily enforced by the database server. Um, there's a few choices we can do. Um, when the parent is mandatory, you make the form key not null. That means it has to have a value. And if it doesn't exist in the parent table, it won't allow things to happen. Uh, optional to mandatory. Um, child's record action, it's difficult to enforce. You have to use, you have to do it some other way. In other words, it's saying that if you try to delete a child record, but you're not allowed to delete the child record unless the parent exists, then you have to take the parent out with it. Um, it's really hard to do. You actually have to write special code just to do it. The database server can't do it. And then, uh, well, something like a trigger or in the application itself where you'd, you'd write logic to go in and go, oh, we're trying to delete this record. So let's crawl up and down the database structure, find everything we need to delete and start deleting backwards to the child record. And you have to do it table by table manually. Well, not manually, but you've got to program so every step happens independently. Whereas the the one where it cascades, the database server takes care of it for you. It's it's instant. You don't even have to think about it. It's just gone. Data's gone. Uh, then you got the mandatory mandatory. It's really difficult to enforce. Um, it, because the problem is, like I said before, chicken, egg. One cannot exist with the other. And you can't put one in until the other exists. So therefore, you have to do some really weird voodoo stuff to get that to work. And basically, nobody actually does it. So mandatory on both sides is almost never done in the field. It'll always be mandatory parent, optional child, and life is easy at that point. Which is that first one, well, that second one from the top. So on this slide, the only ones that actually get used for real in the real world are the top two. Optional and optional, and mandatory optional. So a child can have many, I mean, a parent can have many child records, or it could have none. Each child record must have a parent. End of story. Okay, so that's the end of the week four content. So now I'm going to talk about the assignment. All right. Assignment one is out and visible. It is a group assignment. Congratulations. It sucks to be you. As a person who's had to negotiate, and I'm so glad I don't have to do it because it's your lab process, I have to do it. The number of times I've had with my group member stopped working on the, the thing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah. That I, I'm not a fan of group work because of that, uh, because I've dealt with too much drama over the last 15 years of teaching this kind of stuff. Okay, so you're going to form groups of two or three. They must be same lab section as you. Now, if you are working with DLM and you really can't find a partner in your lab section, you might be able to get them to find you a partner in the other lab section, and then you can probably negotiate around that. Okay, but I don't know how a Doug and a Lem's policy on that's going to be. So check with them. But you can't get, if you're in the Lem's labs, you're not going to get a partner from Doug's lab. Because at that point, what's happening is who's going to grade it? Doug or a Lem? I have no opinion. So this assignment has four files. You will submit four files. And we're actually very generous because we actually tell you to do things a certain way and we give you points for doing it that way. Simon, as long as you tried and you submitted stuff on time, there's points, automatic points at the beginning. So you will be submitting four files, but you're going to be doing three pieces. There's a design document a conceptual diagram, and a physical diagram. And 
I know you haven't really done physical diagrams yet, but it's coming. So the design document, you're going to supply a Word document or a PDF. So something that the profs can actually open on their computer. So if you're a Mac users, we don't want a pages document because we don't have Macs. That means we won't be able to open it. So Word, Open Office, PDF, those are cool. So in this design document, you're going to include a few things. You are going to have an introduction that includes the group members and the chosen scenario. And there's three scenarios for you guys to pick from. Um, so you're going to list off who your group members are. You're going to describe the scenario you chose. Then you're going to list all the entities that you've identified with a short description of what they represent. The description has to be clear and concise. If you pick something that has customers in it, you go, customers contains customer data. You know, information about the customer, such as address. And as you can see, we even provided, hang on, let me make this bigger. Oh, come on, really? All right. You have some examples on here, you know, this entity is used to keep track of clients, customers, uh, infractions, then he tracks all the various traffic infractions that have been captured by red light cameras. It's just, you give it the name and a description of what it is. A list of business rules. Remember I talked about business rules? They must be valid, clear, and concise. You can include constraints such as a minimum quantity of one, for example. A few examples, a customer may place zero, one, or more orders. An order must have one and only one customer. Those are business rules. As long as they're short, clear, and concise, and they follow the rules, business rules, it's cool. A list of unknowns. All initial database designs have unknowns. This must be clear and concise again. So an unknown is you're going to be getting the scenarios. You're going to read through the scenarios or identify, you know, because the scenarios are very different from each other. Even the kind of data you're given is very different from one another. So you're going to go, based on this, there's a few things we don't know. So you put in your unknowns. The unknowns are there to help the profs understand why you made certain decisions. So if you don't know certain things, you put it in. And therefore, if you made some weird design decisions, but you, you already said, we don't know, this is why we're going to make these design, design, design decisions. That covers you. So even if you do something weird, as long as you did say, well, we don't really know. So, you know, this is going to be weird. You know, there's some wiggle room. And a list of assumptions. So again, when you do database design, there are always assumptions. And we all know what, you know, when a person assumes, right? It always makes an ass out of you and me. However, for database design, you end up doing it, making an ass out of yourself all the time because you're assuming a lot of things. Why? Because you don't always have the whole picture. You don't know what the whole picture is until it goes live. Or you've done a few, a few rounds of development and, you know, but this is as if you were beginning right at the beginning. So you haven't gone through multiple rounds of development. There's some assumptions. Um, an assumption would be an order can have multiple statuses. Therefore, an order status is required. There might not even be anything on what you're looking at in the documents that even talk about order statuses, but except for one thing that talks about, you know, has a picture of a single invoice with order status on it. You're going, well, that's a status. And orders obviously can have more than one status, you know, new, filled, shipped, returned, delivered. You think about these things, eh? Yeah, returned, refund, or made, that kind of stuff. So an order can have multiple statuses. Therefore, you probably need a table to track that. An order can have different billing and shipping addresses. A lot of people in here probably buy stuff and they get delivered to wherever they live. So they or then wherever they live is also their billing address. So you probably haven't really experienced too much about the fact that um, for example, the company I'm at before we were bought out, I did all the computer purchasing. Often what would happen is, cause I work from home permanently. So I would build the office on Thurston drive 
it would get delivered to my house so I can set up the computer for the person. Then somebody would come by my house, pick it up to take to the office. Right? So the shipping and billing were two different locations. Even Amazon is like that. You know how when you go to check out, you say, I want to ship to this address, but then you pick a billing method and it might actually be a different address. Exactly. Or, you know, my son wants to take advantage of the fact I've got Prime, so he gets me to order and get delivered to his house. That's what Prime is for. And we were very clear on how the points are broken down. Uh, the profs actually have Excel spreadsheets where they can just put down the numbers that go down and it adds it up for them. So two points for the introduction, four points of the list of entities. Um, so three points of all the entities, one point for descriptions are clear and concise. You know, you can see how the business rules go down, point, 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 point. I mean, I'm not going to read every single point breakdown. I'm sure you guys can read that on your own. Conceptual diagram, which I think you guys are doing right now, right? I think that was lab three. You're doing a conceptual diagram. You will provide the prof with a PNG or a GIF. We don't want a draw IO file. We don't want a Visio file. We don't want whatever other thing you decided to use to draw your conceptual diagram. We want a PNG or a GIF or a JPEG. Okay. I'm not the one grading you, so I don't really care if you don't, but you know, it's a great way to get zero on that task. If we can't open it to grade it, and unless the prof is really generous, I've given zeros for not giving me the right kinds of files. You waste my time, I'm not going to waste my time. And I'm pretty sure they're going to be about the same for that. So you will have all the identified entities. Uh, entities. You'll have um, a candidate key identified on the diagram. So it'll be the extended ERD. Uh, I, whether you use the table format or the box and circles, as long as you've identified the candidate keys, um, relationships are defined as whatever the business rules were. So again, you're going to draw your entities with, you know, the usual uh, that kind of thing. Or you're going to do the other one that has the diamond in the middle. Whatever method you decide to use. Some people will put in one to M. Some people will say uses, you know, they'll put a verb or they'll put a one to M. Check with your lab prof what they want because they're the ones grading it. I've accepted both. Um, you will have a label on your diagram. identifying who are the group members. If you get a picture with no name, we assume you didn't do it. I'm just saying. Um, on this diagram, you're not required to resolve many to many. You're allowed to have, literally, you're allowed to draw the whole Many to many thing. You're allowed to draw it on this diagram. If you want to resolve it, great, but you don't need to. Check on your prof. Some some prof I'm I'm trying to convince them to use the groups, the groups tool where only one person has to submit for the entire group. Um I, mean, I just I've sent out emails and I've had silence. Well no, it's set up in a way that we can add you to a group, but you can't take yourselves out. So but it depends on, in the end, what your lab prof wants. I'm going to be sending them an email tonight to double check, make sure they're on the same page as I am. And again, the breakdown is as follows. Two points for the label. See what I'm talking about? I'm giving you guys free points. That's two points, just putting in a little box with your names on it. Okay. And then there's 10 points for the entities. In other words, did you cover all the entities that you identified? Did you identify the candidate keys? 10 points for the relationships. In other words, do the rules match the business, like the relationship match the rules? 
Um, are they properly defined? In other words, let's say you got customers and orders and you got the relationship going the wrong way where an order can belong to multiple customers, but each customer can only ever have one order. That's backwards. That's you know, taking points off. So we take points off for mistakes. And then we have a physical diagram. So you're going to provide us a physical diagram. It's going to be done in MySQL Workbench, which I think is Lab 4. So you get to do Lab 4 this week, and you're going to learn how to do that lab, that task. Um, you've got to do a few things. It's got to be properly normalized. Yes, we're going to talk about normalization next week. But at this point in time, with what we've discussed as it is, you should be able to handle this mostly it being normalized. Uh, normalization actually tends to be a process of when you're translating data from one source to another source, not when you're doing a clean room design. Um, it includes all the tables, including if you suddenly discover some new tables from the conceptual to the physical. Um, all relationships are defined properly. Uh, primary keys and foreign keys exist. Uh, anything that is derived has been removed. Uh, remember I talked about derived attributes? Date of birth versus age. You always store the date of birth. You don't need to store the age because you can calculate the age from a person's date of birth. You avoid derived attributes. If you leave in a derived attribute, you have to explain why, and you're going to include documentation as to why you chose to leave behind derived attributes. A good example is a line total in an order. Maybe you just don't want to recalculate it every single time you pull up orders at the end of the day. Therefore, you, you're, you're keeping line totals just to make things easier. Um, you picked appropriate data types and lengths. You didn't make everything VARCAR 45. Not everything is VARCAR 45, I'm sorry. I've had people try to justify that, and I'm like, no. Do you have as, there's, you know, as many data types as there are students in this room, they exist for a reason. Use them. If you're not sure what they're for, check with me or check with your lab prof. Um, making everything about VARCAR 255 or an integer is not valid. For example, a postal code would be 7 for Canada or for the U.S. So maybe just make it 10. That way you are covering all the bases, right? Because in Canada, you've got K1K space, you know, 1K1. And in the U.S., originally, they only had five digits, and then they ran out of postal codes because they planned down the road. And they had a, there was a point where a single postal code could cover two and a half million people. What's the point of having a postal code at that point? So they added um, subcodes. So, you know, I know 210-1111, and that'd be station 1111, and it would subdivide the mail. Uh, that's why we have up to 10 digits for an American postal code. And um, you should have a constraint defined that is neither primary key or foreign key. For example, quantity greater than zero. The design tool, no, right in the design tool, uh, which will explain that last, the fourth file. Uh, again, you get points for putting on a label. Because again, we want to know who actually made that diagram. All right. so. My SQL Workbench, and I can show you guys this next week. My SQL Workbench has the ability to export a diagram as an SQL file. You guys don't know what SQL is, but the SQL file allows us, the profs, to double check the um, the constraint rules and stuff. We can open up the text and skin the scan through it and see what's there. And broken down as follows. Again, two points for the identification label. So we're literally giving you guys two, four, six, eight points out of whatever, six points, just for putting in your name. Do you know how many bad assignments I've had to have over the years for me to actually give eight points just for putting your name on the work? Let's think about that. That's me bribing you to put your names on your work. Okay? Five points for creating the tables, five points for the data types. Um, again, I'm going to, like I said, in my email to the two lab profs, I'm going to make sure they're both on the same page where uh, are they going to take off full point or half points for each kind of data type mistake? Um, 
Is there a constraint defined? Is it all properly defined? These uh, two points for submitting the right files. I know it's stupid, but yes, I'm giving you guys. I have to give it to you guys that way because that's how it is. Now, if some of you might be going, well, I don't know what the uh, the um, the scenarios are. If you actually click on the header for the assignment, it'll actually bring you to the assignment page, and at the bottom, there's three scenarios. Okay. Now, your scenarios are as follows. Now, so the first one is a manufacturing plant. So you are given some very specific rules, some sample output based on this. So these rules reflect the sample output. This one's pretty clear and obvious. I'm going to skip to the third one before I do the second one. The dead prime minister high school. When I went through college, you actually called it the dead president high school because it was coming out of an American textbook. It's just I just ripped off that assignment I did when I was in college and renamed a few pieces. It's not plagiarism at all. I actually got permission from my old prof to use it, so it's not plagiarism. You are, this one here is interesting in the sense that you are being given the information from the viewpoint of a layperson. By that, I mean it's a person that doesn't know anything about database design. It's the secretaries, the teachers, the principal at the school telling you, this is what we want. This is the information we need to track. So based on those statements that is included in this, there's these bullet lists of things. You have to actually and figure out what the rules are for each of these entities. And by the way, there's not a single correct answer. There's multiple ways to do each of these. Each snare has multiple ways. The first one is the least flexible because it's pretty clearly stated. Uh, but some people have a hard time with it because it isn't flexible. The sec the third one is flexible. In actual fact, this is one of the fun ones where uh, international students actually struggle a little bit with it more than Canadian students. Um, specifically, there's a section in here that talks about disciplinary actions. And I've often had students that come from certain countries, they're all going, what's a disciplinary action? I said, were you ever bad in school? They go, no, we never acted up in school. I'm like, man, you needed to go to Canadian high school uh, to really experience life <laughs> as a teenager. So this one here has a bunch of things in it. It has, you know, student information, guardian information, enrollments. And you think about it too, and a lot of people make mistakes on the enrollments. Think about it like how it is right now with you guys, where you have a course section where it's a year, a course, a student, and a classroom. You know, these are all things that intersect into an associative entity. But a lot of people will just go, eh, it's an enrollment, one table. No, no you're missing big pieces. Um, and there's more in here, extracurricular activities, post-high school plans. You've all gone through school. At least I hope most of you have gone through school. Therefore, these this not foreign to you. You just never thought about at it from a data point of view. So this one is a good one for people to want that have want to take their real life experiences and carry it forward. Because you know you've experienced school, you have a rough idea how it works. And now you actually have to put it down on paper how it actually works. And now for the trap. The pizza shop. Um, they don't, they're not called that anymore. They got bought out, but that was pretty much the best pizza shop in the West End. It's not actually a fake flyer. It was actually a real place. Um, they're over on Cobden Road, just five minute drive from here. And so the scenario is the pizza shop has a really archaic ordering system and they decided they want to roll their own. Who on earth would want to roll their own? I don't know, but they decided they're going to roll their own. The problem is that they gave you two pieces of information. Since you are a regular customer and you've bought stuff from them all the time, they assume you actually understand how it works. Anybody here ever work in a pizza shop? You know it's complicated, right? And I had another hand here. And you. So the funny thing is about pizza shops that pretty much every other restaurant, other than McDonald's and Harvey's, where you can customize your food, 
order stuff from my Chinese takeout place. Yes, I know it's not real Chinese food. It's junk food. I know it's fake. But you order from a Chinese place, you order something that most you can say, I don't want mushrooms in it. You can't really customize it. They put a little note at the end saying, don't put mushrooms in anything. Or, you know, if you didn't tip them, put extra mushrooms in everything. Whatever. Right? So, you go to an Indian takeout place and you order butter chicken. It's going to be butter chicken. There's no changing that butter chicken. It's going to come out in the container the way it's made. Pizza shops, on the other hand, everything is customizable. Thickness of the crust. How much sauce do you want? How much cheese do you want? How many toppings are you going to have on there? Is it going to be, do you want it well done? Because I've heard that one ordered. They want the pizza well done. They want that bottom almost burnt. Probably because at some point they ordered a pizza and it was like half raw. Because, you know, they weren't keeping track of the pizzas properly and they pulled one out too early. You order a sub. Do you want the lettuce? Do you want the tomatoes? Do you want this? Do you want Everything is customizable. So everything has options. You order the french fries. Do you want gravy? Poutine. Do you want extra cheese? Do you want shredded cheese or cheese curds? Right? Everything is customizable as a pizza shop. So a lot of people go, I've ordered lots of pizza. I know how to do this. Do you? So the pizza shop is a very interesting scenario in the sense that you really have to start thinking outside the pizza box. Literally, you're thinking outside the box. It's a fun one, but it's also very challenging. It's easy to miss steps. So that's why I call it the trap, because some people will jump into it going, this is easy. I understand pizza. I eat pizza six times a week. I know how this works. I just say I want a pizza with like pepperoni, bacon, and sausage, also known as a porker pizza. And the guy and the person, yeah, they just write it down on a piece of paper. It's cool. No. That's going on there, and they're adding the options. I mean, if you've gone to an online website where you can order pizza, you know it gets complicated. There could be salads. You could order a pizza, three pounds of wings, and uh, some cheese, uh, cheese sticks. You know, you're ordering things from different piles. So you have to think about really what is a menu. Like, like let's back up for a second. What is the difference between a pizza? A burger and a sub. Think about it for a second. What's the difference between pizza, burger, and a sub? There is no difference. It's food. Who cares? It could be shawarma. It could be, you know, lasagna. It's all food. It's a it's a thing. The thing has options. The thing has sizes. The thing has customization, but it's all a thing. With add-ons. So technically, are you? And when you look at the menu, does it actually have a section for? Do you actually have tables for the pizza and a pizza and a table for the pasta, a table for the subs? Or could you just have a single menu table with a sub table for options? What happens if the options are shared across multiple kinds of order items? Cheeseburger versus a regular hamburger. Options: They both offer you tomatoes and lettuce. But one doesn't have cheese. Or you want a hamburger, then you want to add cheese and bacon, even though they offer a cheeseburger, a bacon cheeseburger. You know, people are special that way. And it also includes a receipt, so you can have an idea of what the output is out of the system for. Yes, and I actually, when I created this scenario years ago, I literally ordered a pizza just to have a receipt. And then I ate it. That was one of my receipts, yes. That's why, but that's why the phone number is blacked out. <laughs> that's my daughter's favorite pizza, the one at the top. Spicy sausage, onions, and pineapple. If you've never tried it, it's actually really good. And by the way, it's not that cheap anymore. <laughs> uh, what's the year? 2019. So it's that receipt's been around for a bit. So... So those are the three one, the three. So what you have to do by the end of this week, Liz, talk to your lab prof. That's important. Identify your groups, pick your scenario. Because it is due. And I double check, I gotta double check with the course lead. Because I've done this before where I've given the wrong due date. 
Um, it is due. Hang on. Um, let's go look at the calendar. It should be showing on the calendar. It should be due February 19th. So it's either going to be due the 17th or the 19th. I, I'm waiting to hear back from the course lead. Normally she's emailed by now because this is the week we're giving out the assignment. So she normally emails before we give out the assignment, but I haven't heard beep out of her. So, you know, she's a course lead for three different courses. So she might be running a little behind. Um, so it is due end of day on the 19th. Here's the other thing. You must do a demo. Now the demo, depending on what, how the prof decides to handle it, because different profs do it differently, they will sit down with you. You come with your group members and your work. The prof will ask you some questions about your assignment. You do not demo. Automatic zero. If you are sick with COVID, contact the prof ahead of time and maybe you can make arrangements for a remote. So if you get sick the week of the demo and you don't let us know, Unless you've been in a car accident and you're in a coma, TFB. TFB. Do something bad. Okay, there we go. For those of you that don't know, ask the other people that are chuckling what the F stands for. Okay. Historically, I've given zeros because groups didn't bother to show up to demo. They, I actually had a case where I had a student, a group coming in with a 90% on their assignment. They didn't demo. I had to fail them. And I mean, I literally for weeks before and saying, don't forget, you got a demo. And it's actually, now it's a policy. They've actually put in as a policy for this department that courses that require demo, you must demo. The demo is not worth any points. The demo is there to prove that you did the work. But that you got to check with your prof. But normally it's going to be on the week of the 20th. Um, because it's done in lab. So you're that's why you're supposed to be with your lab partner. You come in, sit down. The demo should take less than five minutes per group. <laughs> you show up ready. As in other words, have the documents up and ready. The prof will ask you a few questions. You have to be able to, one everybody in the group, so at least one person in the group has to be able to answer the questions. Hey, I've had cases where I've had three people stand up and go, I don't know. Okay, well, you didn't do the work then. So. The reason historically is we've had people cheat in the sense that they got other people to do their work for them. And then they just submitted it as if it was their work. So now we do demos and we ask very specific questions about the work you submitted. No, no, you both, well, well, all three of you have to come up for the demo. Yeah. One of you should be able to answer the part that you worked on. As a whole, you should be familiar with the other people. You should be able to answer the work you worked on specifically. Uh, which also leads me to the other warning. Um, there's a midterm in that same week. The good news is for you guys, though, this will come as a, a relief, is because the way this course is structured, you will have no work to do the following week at all. It's reading week, and you have zero work for this course. No hybrids, no assignments, no labs. So for this course, you do, you do nothing during reading week. So there's a bit of a load up front. March break, for those that call it March break, that's high school and grade school. It's reading week <laughs> in college. So yeah. Um, also, don't forget that at the end of this week, the hybrid one quiz is due. So there's two sets of slides for you. Those of you that don't know where that content is. Under down here, there's hybrid tasks. Week one, week two. And then under activities and quizzes, which I'm not going to go do because it pulls up people's grades. Uh, in the prof view, I see a lot more than you guys do. You'll see the hybrid quiz one in there. So. But be careful. I mean, it's kind of open book. Hang on, I, I can't hear him.
It's Doof Friday. It's due on the 3rd. The announcement say the 5th? Okay, I'll fix it. Yes, that's right. She sent out an announcement changing my dates on me. Hang on. Yes, I forgot that she changed the dates on me and I didn't go into the system to change the date. My bad. Yeah, it's the 5th. It's just a calendar didn't update. What? It's set right here, but the calendar didn't update it. Oh. There we go. Yes, they moved it. The due date used to be over here. We didn't used to have a due date and an end date. We had a due we had an end date. So now if I go back to the calendar. There you go. Hybrids do it on Sunday night. Done. Thank you. All right. Well, that's that. I mean, it's close enough to the end of the class. I don't see the point of doing what I was going to do. I'll do it next week, talking about the data types and how to use them in the real world and how to solve certain kinds of uh, data situations. And I'll do that after the normalization talk. Um, so that is what's happening on the 7th. On the 14th, I'm going to have a small review, and then I'm going to do a design from raw data all the way to physical design. So you guys have the whole process from start to end on the 14th. That'll be before the assignment is due, so you will have a good idea of what every piece should look like. At least if I was the one grading it, this is roughly what I'd want to see. Okay? I can't because I'm not the one grading you. I can answer some questions about whether or not they interpret it the same way. Yes. It's it's not. Yes. Like show us some of our stuff. 